After stoking coal furnaces for miserable winters and seeing posters, postcards, and photos of Florida, is there a plan? Okay, but how to get there? By railroads? Railroads were the primary travel method to Florida. There, roads were few, mostly cart tracks or Seminole Indian trails. Henry Plant had built access to the Gulf Coast from the north and west, and Henry Flagler from the northeast to the east coast and the Keys. Both Henrys had the same goal, to import valuable freight commodities from Cuba and South America. While the railroads into Florida were built primarily for freight, a steady influx of passengers and tourists escaping winter provided significant income. To serve these tourists, both Henrys built elaborate hotels for cities along each route. With few roads, tourists were area captives, traveling by rail from one expensive hotel to the next, often at incredible nightly costs. A $100 a night room is the equivalent of $1,500 today. Normally, a roadside hotel would cost $2 a night. Plant's Tampa Bay Hotel is now a museum, and the Ponce de Leon is part of Flagler College. Where available, a few wealthier tourists could travel by early auto train. But there was a third Henry, Henry Ford, the inventor of the Model T automobile, in production from 1908 to 1927. It was the first affordable vehicle that permitted travel throughout North America and the world and was instrumental in the development of road systems in the U.S. Further, it has been deemed the most influential car of the 20th century. The T was inexpensive, simple, rugged, reliable, and had interchangeable parts. Most parts interchanged throughout the 20-year production. In 1919, Ford added the option of a battery, electric starter, and lights. His adaptation of the assembly line production method reduced production time from 12 hours to 40 seconds. In 1919, the T cost $385 and would receive a price reduction every year to 1927. One of every two registered cars in 1919 in the United States was a Model T. So how did automobile tourists get to Florida? Well, it began with the Good Roads Movement, championed by Carl Fisher and his promotion of the Lincoln Highway, America's first coast-to-coast -coast road running from Manhattan to San Francisco. A few years later, he produced the Dixie Highway, running from Chicago to Miami, or the alternate route, Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan to Miami. A third highway was developed in 1915, which would run down the East Coast beginning in Calais, Maine to Miami. Further, for folks trying to get from Cleveland to Miami, the Great Lakes Atlantic Highway was developed. Once you got to Florida, there were two routes within the state for the East and West Coasts. Eventually, the Tamiami Trail would link these coasts together. Now, the Dixie was no fluke for Fisher. He owned large land tracks in Miami and would develop the very Tony City of Miami Beach. These two maps show the primary road routes from the Midwest and Eastern states. The Dixie Highway on the left portrays the alternative routes, and the Atlantic Highway on the right the linear route down the East Coast. It should be noted that the Atlantic was not named the Dixie 
as several texts have claimed. The Good Roads Movement didn't promise good roads. Nor did it always deliver. Road hazards were plentiful. The definition of a good road, especially around a campfire, was, that's a good road. Somebody just made it through there yesterday. Motors traveled with at least one spare and several inner tube patch kits, such as the camel kits seen here on the right. Note the camping equipment now on the ground to get at the spare tires and wheels on the car on the left. And the tent lashed to the bumper on the car on the right, which is blocking half the radiator. Here's an example of travel time from LaSalle, Michigan, just north of Toledo, Ohio, to Tampa, Florida. It took 17 days, and 100 miles a day was considered a good run at 12 miles an hour. Pavement was scarce, usually found only in the cities, if then. Otherwise, roads consisted of dirt, mud, or sand. It was a network of existing roads, not a linear route, and it was easy to get lost. To help motorists through the states where the Dixie Highway was, signage was erected on utility poles with a red band and a DH logo. Motorists encountered washed out bridges or no bridges at all. To ford these, rope build flatbeds were used. Motorists also encountered steep mountains and grades often littered with cars with burned out engines blowouts were constant. Motorists also traversed swamps filled with snakes and mosquitoes. There were few services along the routes, and motorists also encountered filthy camps for overnight stays. Now gas tanks in many cars were under the front cowl or under the seat. There, gas was fed by gravity into the carburetor. Vehicles that had early fuel pumps found them to be considerably unreliable. The Model T's tank was under the front seat, and ascending steep grades would cause the gas flow to stop because the tank was now below the carburetor, which stopped the engine. These cars had to coast back down in reverse, turn around, and then drive up in reverse. This photo depicts a modern ferry with a cranked winch. This allowed passengers and vehicles to ford rivers where no bridges existed. Florida, here we come, who arrived by auto, not the wealthy. It was the new middle class, created in part by the affordable Model T, in addition to Henry Ford's $5 a day wage in 1914, which doubled the average wage in all industries. The 2019 equivalent is $125. The ad for the compact auto touring tent indicated that you got two private rooms, two entrances, a floor, and two hammocks for $6.50. They also came with freestanding tents, such as the Birch Nifty Umbrella Auto Tent, which could be erected from road to camp in five minutes, provided it wasn't the first time you erected it or tried to set it up at night. Or in pop-up camping trailers, such as this auto camp trailer, where you could experience the joys of the open road for $385 in 1918. They came singly or in groups. No trunk. Early vehicles did not have integral trunks. Some had a rear rack for a wood trunk, but any horizontal surface was used for stowing gear. Yes, most traveled in auto campers, but some came with Len Curtis's Adams Motor Bungalow the first commercially built trailer in production from 1917 to 1923 at a cost of $1,200. Production stopped in 1923 when no more affluent buyers could be found. 
The Adams was named after Curtis's brother-in-law, whom Curtis hired to run the company, while he continued with his airplane and engine operations. It was later renamed the Curtis Air Car and resumed production from 1926 to 1942. Many came in homemade house cars, such as the one seen here with its faux brick siding. Another example, note the chimney on top, the huge trunk in the back, and a closed tree actually sprouting from the running board. Some came in conversions, such as this Model T pickup with an extended bed and a slide out underneath for cooking and eating. But very few came in aftermarket conversions, such as this Zegelmeyer camper car, which cost $550. It was a very trick affair and replaced the entire body on the Model T. As you folded down the sleeping platforms, the roof would raise and walls could be fitted with either windows or screens. So who were these guys? How were they able to spend six months in Florida? They were the burgeoning middle class. They came from 300 80 different occupations, both professional and the trade, including farmers, dairymen, contractors, builders, carpenters, electricians, painters, doctors, lawyers, merchants, policemen, preachers, war veterans, manufacturers, show business people, retirees, service pensioners, and their families. In 1919, 24 auto campers converged at Tampa's DeSoto Park. How did this happen? Did they all caravan from a particular state or meet up along the road? Probably not. Upon arriving in Tampa or any other town or city, it was common to ask where the municipal camp or park was located. When they got to Tampa, they were directed to DeSoto Park. The Tin Can Tourists. What's in a name? This is an excerpt from the 1919 journal of Mrs. William Austin from LaSalle, Michigan. About that time, the city tourists found out we were having such a good time they wanted to take over the Tampa Park. We talked about it in our nightly meetings. One night, Mr. Heiser talked about it. He suggested we call our organization the Tin Can Tourists after our Tin Lizzie's. Tin Lizzie was an affectionate name for the Model T. All other cars had a hard time getting through the sand roads. I supported Mr. Heiser's motion. The motion carried. Before that, we had a dozen names. In fact, everyone you almost you talked to had a different name. Mr. Freeman was elected our can opener. The tin can tourists of the world received their official Florida State Charter in 1920. Also from the same journal about the tin can. Mr. Robelstead went down on 7th Street and purchased gas at a reduction of one cent per gallon if we would buy our gasoline from him. He told us to put a tin can on the radiator for identification as TCTs to buy gas. It was not long before everyone had cans for their cars. After we named it Tin Can Tourist, we put TCT on the cans for our emblem. So, from the original journal source, tin can tourists were not named for heavy metal cans carried for gas and water. They were not named for cans of food imported from other states. They were not named for empty or rusted tin cans soldered or welded to a radiator cap. They were not named for tin cans slung around a radiator filler neck. The tin can was used when hung from the filler neck of a disabled vehicle as a sign of distress. Also, tin cans with painted TCT were placed in merchant store windows for discounts. Automobiles in the teens and twenties usually only had one gauge, an ammeter. No gas or temperature gauge. The Boyce motor meter was invented as a sight viewed indicator for water temperature, replacing the radiator cap. At five to fifteen dollars, 
the $15 one being on the high end, which was lighted, it was indispensable to all automobiles. Coolant was not used in engines until the late 20s, and often then with questionable and expensive results. So to cover, solder, or weld a tin can to a radiator cap or a motometer would defeat its purpose. Plus, constant removal of a rusty tin can from a cap would be an unhealthy idea. In researching hundreds of tin can tourists' photos, not one revealed a can on a radiator cap. Also, hanging a can from a radiator neck would damage the exposed cooling fins and tubes while driving. Membership required no dues. You did receive a membership card in person. The requirements to become a member were that you had to be 12 or more years old, of good moral character, how this was determined is unclear, live in a tent, car, house car, trailer, or nearby cottage. The initiation consisted of learning the secret handshake, the secret sign, the secret password, and singing the Tin Can Tourist song. The objective? To fraternally unite all campers. There was a written constitution and articles and bylaws consisting of keeping and leaving a clean camp, obeying the golden rule, destroying no property, owning no Florida property, stealing nothing, and providing or enjoying wholesome entertainment. All members were issued a numbered membership card, and membership was free. On the obverse of the card was printed the list of officers for the year that you joined. Membership governing officers included the royal can opener, secretary, a treasurer, and a sergeant at arms. Also, a TCT police court was established. Children could be registered to attend local schools at 50 cents per week. The growth, beginning in 1919 at 24 members, ballooned to 17,000 members in 1921 and a year later to 30,000 members. Tin Can Tourist Camps were established throughout Florida. Here's an example of the Gainesville Tin Can Tourist Camp, which was also the site of the Second Winter Convention. Canners didn't flock to just one camp, or three or four, for the entire season. There were several. This map shows 15 of the 38 known camps to visit and stay, including those for the four official conventions during the season. Homecoming, Thanksgiving, Winter Convention, and Going Home Convention. The Royal Can Opener title change occurred in 1923 to the Royal Chief. The title change was due to a more serious consideration of leadership. This is Royal Chief Otto Schoop's site and his Packard. Note the TCT emblem on the Packard radiator and a motor meter radiator cap. And here we see the Tin Can Tourist Police Court with Otto Schoop sitting in front. There are deputies on his right wearing cloth stars to round up the usual suspects for kangaroo court justice, usually small violations of the bylaws. Here we see an original license plate topper. Members could be identified with license plate toppers instead of the mythical tin can. The license plate topper appears again on this 1947 and 1948 Mercury. Another member identification was this brass medallion with the TCT logo. 
This Model T sports an original, now recently reproduced and available. Here's a radiator badge, a couple of them actually, seen on the radiator of this 1923 Essex on the left in the Arcadia Tin Can Tours Camp in 1925. This colorized postcard depicts tent campers overlooking the beautiful Tampa Bay. Curiously scrawled upside down in the margin is, Just got here yesterday from Sarasota. In 1920, DeSoto Park offered free sites, as well as restrooms, a wash house, hot and cold running water, and free entertainment. The canners shown in the photo are holding up their hand with the secret C sign. Also, note the ages of children running from toddlers to the teens, and we trust the two that are standing in back of the strollers contain dolls and not babies. The wash house or campfire was the best place for local information, what to see, what stores and gas stations offered discounts to members, and where to go for the best camps or parks. Wash House socializing and get-together was popular for both men and women in both in the mornings and the evenings. Meetings for information were held mostly to schedule summer reunions, just as they are today. Entertainment could include pony rides, horseshoes, volleyball, shuffleboard, cards, fishing, baseball, listening to or playing in the TCT band, and dancing. If you wanted to dance with elephants, you could do that too, but outside the park. Not merely content with Florida conventions, canners expanded the fund to summer reunions. The first was held in 1921 at Traverse City, Michigan, an already famous vacation area. This article from the Battle Creek Moon Journal states, Traverse City host to tin can tourists. Many of the several thousand autoists who have come here for the summer convention of the Tin Can Tourists of the World, which opens Monday, are already camping here. It is not a formal affair, consisting mostly of getting together and renewing acquaintances made in Florida last winter or in California or at Alaska in other years. There is no information on any Tin Can Tourist conventions in California or Alaska. There was no automobile travel to Alaska until completion of the Alcan Highway, which was begun during World War II and completed in 1948. This photo shows a sign painter putting the finishing touches on a summer reunion welcoming sign. In 1930, the summer reunion was held in Portage, Wisconsin, and here we see a row of tent campers. It was about this time that commercial travel trailer production first began ramping up. Now, Tampa was to host a tin can tourist convention from 1919 to 1924. But early on, the bloom was off that rose. Why? Well, beginning with the local Ybor City residents just across the road, who had petitioned City Hall that year and continued for four years to reclaim their park. The mayor of St. Petersburg decided to chip in and said that the tin can tourists were not wanted 
The more you give them, the more they want, and they bring no money into a town and help it none, said he, who had never hosted any tin can tourist rally. The Florida governor, R.D., jumped on this too. The penny-pinching canners came with one pair of underwear and one $20 bill and changed neither. These disparaging statements were untrue, especially the underwear part. Other names earned were trailer trash, vermin, squatters, yokels, hobos on wheels, and deadbeats. Conversely, the tin can tourist camps brought tens of thousands of dollars to the local economies and were the primary reason that Florida could improve their road systems. By 1930, members were considered no longer undesirable. But the stigma continued for another 80 years. Note the vagabond trailer emblem with the logo of a hobo with a bindle stick, which probably didn't help. Lured Pulp Fiction novels with covers like these didn't help either, as seen on these covers in the late 30s, 40s, and 50s. The same stigma continued into the 90s with Cousin Eddie's Condor parked outside the Griswold home during Christmas vacation. You can still see the stigma on TV today with the Simpsons cartoon characters Cletus and Brandine Spuckler and their 70 kids, 49 of whom were named and one is still attached by umbilical cord named Embry Joe. Now let's look at another tin can tourist camp. The Braden Castle Park story begins in 1850 when Joseph Braden built this large house on land fronting the confluence of the Braden and Manatee rivers just north of his 900 acre sugar plantation. Known as the castle for its size, it served as a family home and refuge for local settlers during Seminole Indian attacks. After Braden's bankruptcy, it was abandoned and partially destroyed by fire in 1906. The city of Bradenton was named after Joseph Braden. Some canners felt that they needed to set down roots after the 1924 ejection from Tampa, but the bylaws said that they couldn't own Florida land. The Tin Can Tourist Royal Chief and some members created a shell club to get around this and called it the Camping Tourists of America. They bought together 38 acres on the confluence of the Manatee and Braden Rivers for $16,000. There they planted 200 lots for sale. If you bought a lot, you had to build a cottage within one and a half years or you forfeited your deed. Rapidly, a self-contained community arose containing a hall, men's and women's clubs, a gas station, a library, a grocery store, a post office, a Western Union office, a barber shop, community restrooms. Also, two boat docks were built as well as a 700-foot fishing pier and a camping area was cleared on the river. Shuffleboard, horseshoe areas, and a large lagoon were established, and in 1983, Braden Castle Park was placed on a National Register of Historic Places. It is currently home to six Tin Can Tourist members. This postcard of the early Camping Tourists of America at Braden Castle Park shows the office building with its bell tower and the large meeting hall behind it. Another postcard depicts the camping area overlooking the mile-wide Manatee River.
This aerial shot appearing on a postcard shows the campus with its two boat docks on the Braden River, the long fishing pier on the Manatee, and the lagoon dredged in 1940. Little has changed in the park since then. A series of photos presents the grocery store, the attached Western Union office, a postcard with travel trailers now supplanting the tent campers in the camping area, the gazebo overlooking the lagoon, and the original 1926 fire engine. With the huge increase in auto camping, new industries arose to support it, especially for cooking and sleeping. Here is a 53-piece kitchen kit for $6.15 on the left, and a running board kitchenette with stove, oven, and icebox on the right. Those who were handy made their own such as this one permanently installed on the running board and rear fender. What appears to be a possible tin can on top of the radiator is actually a radiator neck extension for the hex, knobbed, or dog bone cap to permit easier radiator filling. It was difficult to unscrew these hot multi-threaded Model T radiator caps without an extension. Some unusual cooking equipment, which could be named Manifold Destiny, included this manifold invention for cooking. It consisted of an upright extension to a steel plate and more than fulfilled the statement, slaving over a hot stove. Some really unusual cooking equipment is shown on this Pontiac. You could cook your meal while driving too, with a tailpipe connection mounted to a bumper with an attached pressure cooker. A meat and vegetable stew would cook during an hour's drive. The upgrade from auto tents to trailers began with Arthur Sherman's home-built covered wagon in 1929. So popular, he left his business to create the Covered Wagon Company, which, by 1938, was producing 1,000 units per month, as well as spawning a myriad of travel trailer competitors. By 1938, this new industry grossed $30 million in sales. It was one of two manufacturing industries not only to survive, but expand during the Great Depression. The other, the diner industry. The photo on the right shows the architectural change from the boxy 1929 trailer to the streamlined example of an undetermined make in 1936. Knowing that hundreds of thousands of canners were a potential market, trailer manufacturers brought their new models to conventions in Florida. Sales were brisk due to discounts since salesmen did not want to tow them back. As cities saw there was tourist money to be made, so began the musical chairs invitations. This Arcadia camp shows a mix of tents and travel trailers. Arcadia created a contract for tin can tourists from 1924 to 1932. In 1924 at the Winter Convention, over 300,000 members attended. Group meals often took days to prepare. This Thanksgiving at Arcadia began days earlier with the digging of long trenches, the firing of wood for charcoal, 
and the cutting of green branches to hold slabs of beef. Here's another photo of a group meal, the 1922 chow line at the Indy Atlantic TCT Florida camp right on the Atlantic Ocean. Note the chow line disappearing out of camera range and the sizes of tin cans used for food services. Family meals, of course, could be prepared and enjoyed either outside or inside tents, RVs, or trailers. White gas stoves, such as seen at the lower left, made preparation much easier. This very thin family appears to have had a number of air casseroles, a term for a non-existent meal, like a wish sandwich. Perhaps the photo was taken for a magazine spread and a future meal was more than a plate of bananas. This couple is about to enjoy a much healthier airless meal consisting of fried chicken, salad, and bread. Next stop, Sarasota! Sarasota! Next stop. In 1932, Arcadia and the Sarasota mayors fought to host a winter convention. In 1932, Sarasota won. In 1934, membership stood at 800,000. In 1938, members spent $650,000 in Sarasota, but were no longer welcome. Why? Because Sarasota had become a tin canner's town. The stigma continued. The colorized postcard shows the Sarasota Tin Can Tourist Park, also known as Payne Park. This is an aerial view of the Sarasota Camp, aka Payne Park, and at that time the home of the Boston Red Sox Spring Training. Next stop, Tampa! Tampa! Next stop! and storm clouds were on the horizon. In 1937, huge rains made many roads impassable both for Midwest and Northeast members, plus trailer manufacturers to travel to Florida. Other Florida towns began enacting repressive ordinances for all TCT camps, including one-hour parking, no cooking, and lot taxes. Also in 1937, Roosevelt's recession began, and that was coupled with the United Auto Workers' strike. The ATA, Automobile Tourists of America, a splinter group from Tin Can Tourists, held its 1938 winter convention a week later, vying for attendance. So attendance was down, membership was down. In 1938, a decision was made for Tampa's new municipal park, which included a five-year contract beginning in 1939. This aerial photo shows the extent of the Ohio River flooding, which went on for months, preventing travel to Florida. This colorized postcard shows a few of the 1,200 trailers that had gathered to celebrate the Tin Can Tourist 20th anniversary at the Tampa Municipal Trailer Park in 1939. A year later, 2,000 trailers would assemble at the same park. How did canners learn of convention schedules? There was no newsletter, nor means of contacting hundreds of thousands of members. Conventions were advertised in local, regional, and national newspapers, as well as automobile, trailer, camping, and other trade magazines. This ad notes summer and winter conventions after the United States declared war on Japan and Germany. And here's another ad for the 1942 summer reunion well after the United States declared war on Japan and Germany. With the advent of World War II, manufacturing industries ceased production of peacetime goods and 
were quickly converted to war production facilities for large and small war materiel. Civilian automobile, truck, and travel tailor production was stopped in February 1942. With jobs left vacant by servicemen, large groups of men and women migrated to these city factories, but housing opportunities were non-existent. Recognizing this, the federal government requested many travel trailer manufacturers to produce the temporary committee trailer. These were produced from 1942 to 1943. Over 35,000 of them were built, measuring 8 feet by 22 feet long, made from homosote, and built at $750 each. Rental charge was to be capped at $6.50 per month. Gas and rubber tire rationing prevented all recreational travel beginning in May 1942 in the East and by December 1942 for all other states. The Florida governor wrote FDR to exempt tin can tourists from gas and tire rationing. Why? Because the Florida economy now depended on them. FDR rejected it. As a result, tin can tourists had to stay home. Homozote is a mixture of paper and glue rolled flat for panels to be screwed to frames. Essentially, it's paper mache. When its protective paint covering wore through, homozote melted like ice cream. Campsites for defense workers were located close to the factories throughout the country. This one contained over 200 committee trailers. A minimum of steel was used for the frames and a run of copper wiring allowed just one outlet and one bulb socket. There were no interior water facilities. The centralized wash houses and restrooms provided that. Immediately following the end of World War II, automobile production resumed in July 1945. By October, the War Production Board dropped the control of material supplies, but retooling efforts also affected production of new cars, trucks, and travel trailers for an eager public. By 1946, aircraft aluminum was available again, and these two makes were built using aircraft architecture and aircraft aluminum. There were still auto campers, though, for those not wanting to tow trailers or own RVs. Nash Motors provided this option with their new 1949 Nash Air Flight, also known now as a potato bug. It was a roof tent option, coupled with Nash's fold-down front seats and Nash mattresses. The kids slept on top and Nash provided screen inserts for the sidecar windows. The changing room was held on one side and a fly tent on the other side for cooking. After the war, membership demographics changed, now consisting mostly of retirees or farmers and policemen, civil servants on pensions. There were few children, and they were not wanted anyway, as the philosophy had changed, and it was thought that children were better educated by staying at home in their school systems, rather than traveling around Florida every week or month to a different school. In 1948, the Winter Convention consisted of 1,500 trailerites, of which 500 were full-time squatters, meaning that they never left that particular campground. Lot rent had been established at $12 a month and included all utilities. In 1948, each camera family spent two to $300 a month in Florida, but cities were still vying for winter convention. In 1948, membership stood at 100,000. By 1953, membership totals had dropped further. This picture shows some of the few trailers and members that had gathered at the 1953 Arcadia Winter Convention. Conventions since the 20s were not haphazard. 
Daily events were printed in programs. Later Thanksgiving conventions were held in the TCT Melbourne Park Camp in 1956 and at the Eustace Camp in 1978. Compare these to the Arcadia Camp Thanksgiving seen earlier. The 1978 Thanksgiving was the last Florida convention as city-owned camps diminished with the advent of motor courts and mobile home parks. TCT decline was due to a number of factors, including the proliferation of baby boomers and families to try camping throughout America. This new interest created a large demand for travel trailers. Additionally, our national and state parks promoted visits by creating travel trailer sites. Travel became easier with reduced travel time using the new interstate highways. Plus, those snowbirds who continued migrating to Florida or the southwest now flocked to mobile home parks, which offered full amenities such as pools, courts, libraries, meeting halls for meals and entertainment, and access to golf courses and beaches. Additionally, mobile home parks offered gated security, and Florida presented full-time living in Florida residency for tax purposes. Parks for seniors were established with the proviso that you needed to be 55 or more year old to be a resident. In the 1980s, the Tin Can Tourist held small rallies in Michigan and Wisconsin with some monthly luncheons. Tin Can Tourist was unofficially laid down by 1988. If you thought the Tin Can Tourist Club was dead and buried, you'd be wrong. With Forrest Bone's 1998 tenure as president of the Vintage Airstream Club, he found the one-make club to be too restrictive. In discussing this with the Vintage Airstream Club's founder, Bud Cooper, who provided an overview of the Tin Can Tourist as an overall inclusive make club, Forrest and Jerry began researching the Tin Can Tourist history and found that the name was clear and could be registered as a continuation of the original club which occurred that same year. In 1998, Forrest and Jerry Bone hosted the first renewal gathering at Camp Dearborn in Milford, Michigan, just down the road from the GM Proving Grounds. This was to be for all makes, regardless of year, and 75% of those that attended own vintage makes, just as they do today. 22 units attended, and by the year end, 50 members were accepted as charter members. Annual gatherings continue through the current year and over 400 rallies and events and caravans have been held between 1998 and 2018. Here's Forrest on the left speaking in his coach's voice without the need for a microphone at a 1998 first renewal gathering at Camp Dearborn. On the right are new canners enjoying their first dinner. Two years later, winter reunions continued at Tampa's Florida trade show where 11 units appeared. 2001 through the current year, Camp Dearborn fall campouts were added and winter conventions were held in Florida at various venues until settling at Sertoma Youth Ranch where they are held today and attendance now tops over 100 units. In 2001 was the coming of age through growth and the appointment 
of regional representatives, representatives at large, or in state representatives, all of whom host regional and state rallies. The timeline continues with the tin can tourist expanding to Canada, United Kingdom, France, Japan, Australia, and the Netherlands, all with international representatives. Open house walkthroughs provide new membership. In 2004, the Hall of Fame was established for club members who had made a significant contribution to the vintage trailer and motorhome community. To date, it contains 21 inductees. In 2006, Forrest Bone was named Exalted Chief Royal Tin Can Opener, a combination of both earlier names and Jerry, the Royal Exalted First Lady. It is expected that both will receive emeritus status fairly soon. In 2006, that same year, the first caravan was held to celebrate the bicentennial celebration of the National Road. Thirty vintage rigs traveled from Cumberland, Maryland, where it began, to its terminus in Vandalia, Illinois, on the Mississippi River. The National Road was our nation's first federally funded highway, much of which was surveyed by a younger George Washington. Days prior to our arrival to or through towns or cities along the National Road, newspapers and radio and TV stations noted our expected arrival. As we approached Indianapolis, its world-famous police motorcycle escort met us outside city limits. From there, through the entire county, they led the caravan with sirens wailing and lights flashing straight through with all intersections closed. Many of the officers stood on their saddles, arms outstretched. It was, for all of us, the thrill of a lifetime. With many vintage trailers and RVs requiring restoration or total rebuild, the results were and continue to be incredible by both owners and newly created businesses. To reward these efforts, competitions were established for national and other rallies to recognize them. The Camp Dearborn Annual Concours d'Elegance has been chaired by Jerry Bone since its inception. The photo below shows the efforts to make a winner of Ken and Lana Hindley's 1936 Aero Car and 1938 International D15 shown as found. The restoration work was obviously highly successful. The Hindley's rig has won awards in highly competitive shows wherever it has been entered. The interior is just as perfect and contains the original intercom to the truck which permitted communication to or from the driver. It was legal back in the day for passengers to ride in travel trailers. Timeline continues in 2007 with 140 units attending the 10th annual gathering at Camp Dearborn. That same year, 44 units attended Winter Convention at Cedar Key, Florida, where we entertained 2,000 visitors in five hours for our open house. In 2009, 160 units attended the 12th annual gathering. It was a sellout. In 2010, was Pennsylvania's Route 6 caravan. And in 2012, 57 units attended Florida Winter Convention at Sertoma Youth Ranch. In 2013, the Lincoln Highway Centennial Caravan was held. A year later, 180 units attended the annual gathering. 
Then in 2015, the Super Duper Uper Looper Caravan was held to travel around the Upper Peninsula in Michigan. 2016, we saw 25,000 visitors for a four-day open house at the Tiny House Festival outside St. Augustine, Florida. It was way over the top, and we vowed not to attend another Tiny House Festival. In 2019, the Centennial Celebration and Conventions and Caravans are to be held in Florida and Michigan. Two thousand fourteen's annual gathering in Milford was the first sellout. Additional park areas have been allocated for growth. Two thousand and ten was the Pennsylvania Route Six caravan. It consisted of twenty units. It took ten days. We had six open houses, ate at three vintage diners and two road houses, and ended up at one defunct amusement park. National Geographic has identified Route 6 as being one of America's most scenic drives. The Wayfarer's neon signs on the left are particularly welcome in either order. The Pierce Arrows Travel Lodge was made by the Pierce Arrow Motor Car Company for just one year. It came in three different sizes. It was an effort to keep the Pierce Arrow Motor Car Company afloat. It didn't help, and Pierce Arrow would die the following year. In 2013, the Lincoln Highway Centennial Caravan was held and contained 25 units. It took us 14 days traveling from Vantwer, Ohio, to Kearney, Nebraska, the exact midway point from New York City and San Francisco along the route. We were offered free campgrounds or overnights in exchange for open houses. We were also offered free meals. In Kearney, over 12,000 spectators saw us parade through the downtown area. We found that it was still easy to get lost on the Lincoln Highway, and we looked for the concrete markers with the L logo, just as travelers did beginning in 1913. If we crossed the Tama, Iowa Bridge, we knew we were safe, as the Lincoln Highway is spelled out in concrete. The photo above shows the group participants of the caravan standing or kneeling in front of John Kenner Culp's 1947 Westcraft, which had been donated to the RV Heritage Museum and Hall of Fame after his death. It has since been retrieved and restored by a Tin Can tourist couple. Below that, you see the photo of a Kearney, Nebraska City Park, where we camped prior to the parade and the week-long festivities. And here we are, parading down Central Avenue in Kearney on the last day of the week-long celebration there. We turned off and parked on a side street to hold an open house for the 12,000 visitors. In 2015, the Super Duper Uper Looper Caravan was held for a week from July 30th to August 8th. It took 10 days to travel around Michigan's Upper Peninsula, along with a traveling cater. 29 units attended, encountered no black flies, but carried plenty of dogs. And here is the staging area for the caravan, for the Super Duper Uper Looper Caravan, as it prepares to cross the famous Mackinac Bridge in the background to the Upper Peninsula. Here are some hungry canners in the chow line, and 
a partial log. Do canners enjoy entertainment just as much as their forebearers did? Absolutely. Here is Bugs Beto and his band performing hits from the 50s through the 80s under the big top. With dancing on tabletops in period clothes, as nothing unusual. popular annual Friday night's light contest continues to amaze. Presentations such as Dan Hirschberger's 1920s motor camping demonstration continues and Hunt Jones's on the road series of presentations here showing the history of America's drive-in theaters. As well as Tim Heinz's informative travel trailer history presentation. The Great Kensington entertains with sword swallowing, fire breathing, and hammering large spikes up his nose. and a beaming Terry Evans beginning to list her teams for the annual treasure hunt. Our exalted Chief Royal Tin Can Opener Forrest Bone presided over two different weddings, one at Camp Dearborn and the other at Sertoma Youth Ranch. And several hundred canners witnessed a proposal at Winter Convention recently. In the category, Everything Old is New Again, is this true of the Tin Can Tourists? Indeed it is. Everything old is new again and still rolling. Witness John Driscoll's 1949 Federal House car which traveled from Oregon to the Tin Can Tourist 2017 Florida Winter Convention. For 100 years, the Tin Can Tourist continued to roll on. Our heartfelt thanks to Forrest and Jerry Bone for all their efforts to continue our rolling history. The Tin Can Tourists, 100 years of rolling history. Let's keep it rolling.